I honest and truly miss it. I would have stayed longer, but things happen. Going back to Niagara Falls is always tough for Helen McInnes. It's a place where she worked for almost 20 years. A lot of good memories, some bad, some good. Sad in some ways, and I don't know. So it's hard to mix feelings. She was diagnosed with cancer in 2002, and now wonders whether it was caused by Roundup, one of the herbicides she was exposed to. Wherever you see the bush area, basically back through there, is where they'd spray also. And I thought, geez, you know, here I am walking and I can taste it, and it's on my clothes. Helen thinks that Roundup may have caused her cancer because it is now at the center of a massive controversy. Monsanto, who sold the herbicide for 40 years, was found guilty of having hidden possible links between the chemical and cancer. Not only that they knew about it causing cancer, that they went out of their way to attack scientists that raised concerns, and to full out, and I mean this straightforwardly, commit fraud. Well, you believe what they tell you. You believe what they tell you, and then you find out afterwards they betrayed you by not, by not telling you the real truth. Thousands of people like Helen have been looking for answers since internal documents came out that exposed Monsanto's most closely held secrets. Those documents tell a story that leads north to former Health Canada officials. When Roundup first came on the market in the mid-1970s, it was considered a miracle product. Roundup, a major product of the future, will have extensive worldwide application in plantation as well as crop agriculture. The herbicide kills almost all plants that it's sprayed on, except those genetically modified to resist it. Roundup's magic ingredient is a chemical called glyphosate. Our story begins in 1976, when Roundup was first used commercially in Canada. That year, Ian Munro begins his meteoric rise at Health Canada. You can see him here, interviewed by the CBC about the dangers of mercury. He began to develop signs of methylmercury intoxication. He would eventually become a top official at the Food Directorate. The point that the Health Department takes on these matters is that if there is no evidence to indicate the material is unsafe. In the mid-1980s, Ian Munro left Health Canada. With several ex-colleagues, he founded Cantox, a company specializing in toxicology consulting. Remember that name, Cantox. It will become important later in this story. Ian Monroe's path will eventually cross that of Helen McInnes, but let's not go too fast. The year after Cantox is established, Helen started working at Niagara Provincial Park, first as a shuttle driver and then as a supervisor. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I love meeting different people from all over the world. I mean, where can you work where you get to meet all different types of people and work with all different types of people. And, and like I say, people pay thousands of dollars to come here and I get to see it every day. It's, 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 it, was, it was fun. During routine park maintenance, she noticed an employee wearing protective gear, spraying pesticides along sidewalks and in the parking area. He had a white um, jumpsuit type thing on, rubber boots, gloves, mask, head all covered with a hood, you know, so it, he was protected where I wasn't. I was concerned about it because I could taste it. In another incident, a colleague became sick after being exposed to the herbicide. Helen was also worried about visitors to the park. Kids were exposed to, well, not just children, but 
adults and everybody was exposed to, to it, even though he might have been gone maybe three hours prior, it's still in the air. She talks to her health and safety representative about it, but the spraying continues. Yes, yes, yes. It went on for many years. I mean, all the time I was there in the spring and throughout the summer, they would come in and spray. Helen thinks she could have been exposed to products like Roundup around 50 times. In Toronto, at around the same time, things are going well for Ian Monroe and his new company, Cantox. The department's uh, major programs in respect to lead. He puts his experience to work for industry, one with a notorious reputation. Light up a camel. Camel's real taste satisfies longer. The tobacco industry. This is years before the massive scandals were exposed that showed how tobacco companies hid the dangers of smoking. I'd walk a mile for a camel. R.J. Reynolds was pursuing a secret project. Its goal was to help the company avoid regulation under Canada's Food and Drug Act. To approach Health Canada, R.J. Reynolds used Ian Monroe. These documents confirm that Ian Monroe had two confidential meetings with his former boss and personal friend, the then assistant deputy minister. They discussed how R.J. Reynolds could be exempted from reporting the tar levels of a new cigarette product. The project was eventually abandoned. Over the years, Cantox won contracts from federal and provincial governments. It was also mired in multiple controversies. In 1998, Cantox was hired to assess the health risks posed by 700,000 tons of toxic sludge left after a coal plant in Sydney, Nova Scotia, was decommissioned. I don't think there's any concern at this time. We have looked at the data that's available right now. There's no concern from a health perspective. Cantox concluded that there was no risk to human health. Une conclusion qui a eu l'effet d'une bombe auprès des résidents de la rue Frédéric qui ont quitté la réunion en trombe. I can't accept it and I won't accept it. This is a joke. And I won't put up with it. The Cantox report would later be harshly criticized by other experts. In 1999, Cantox was hired to assist a proposed Irving refinery expansion. La chef du Nouveau Parti démocratique, Elizabeth Weir, affirme que le gouvernement du Nouveau-Brunswick a eu tort de donner carte blanche à Irving Oil sur la foi du rapport favorable de la société Cantox de Halifax, une société, dit-elle, qui a la réputation de favoriser l'entreprise sur l'intérêt public. Cantox eventually gained an international reputation by writing risk assessments for the plastics, chlorine, food additives and pesticide industries, and eventually for Monsanto. This will have important consequences for Helen McInnes, whose life will soon take an unexpected turn. A courtroom in California was the scene of an epic battle in 2018. The jury found the company at fault for allowing the man to contract cancer. Plus de 289 millions de dollars un jardinier américain atteint d'un cancer, c'est bien sûr inédit. The damages were later reduced to 78 million dollars. Glyphosate does not cause cancer. It's been perfectly safe and that's been demonstrated for more than four decades. Monsanto, since purchased by Bayer, has had to defend itself from the allegations that were made at trial. Allegations made in internal documents that Brent Wisner, a lawyer for the plaintiffs in the case, fought to make public. According to Brent, these court documents, known as the Monsanto Papers, show how Monsanto worked to create doubt about science which questioned the safety of Roundup. It's part of the, the playbook that they've gotten from the tobacco years of how to make up science in an effort to discredit good science. To sow that doubt, Brandt says Monsanto hid studies. We show studies that Monsanto has done that show real risks that have been buried, that were never given to any regulatory agency, never given to 
the scientific community. Les désherbants Roundup sont une des méthodes les plus efficaces pour nettoyer votre jardin ou vos champs. Mais qu'en est-il de la substance active principale, le glyphosate? It's the end of the 1990s. A growing number of independent studies are finding possible toxic effects of glyphosate and Roundup. Monsanto hired a renowned British researcher, James Perry, to look into this. Dr. Perry concluded that glyphosate and Roundup are potentially genotoxic and can cause cancer-related damage. He suggests additional studies. The response from one of Monsanto's officials. We want to find someone who can be influential with regulators when genotox issues arise. My read is that Perry is not currently such a person. Monsanto, in response, and we have it in the documents, straight up says, we are not going to do these studies. That, you know, this guy was supposed to be our spokesperson on these issues, and he's not it. And so they never submitted that report to the EPA. It is actually a violation of federal law. They never submitted it to Health Canada. Monsanto says it conducted additional studies, as suggested by Dr. Perry, and found no genotoxic effects from glyphosate or its formulations. We don't know Dr. Perry's opinion on that. He has since passed away. But the issues raised by Dr. Perry foreshadowed more problems for Monsanto. A study on Canadian farmers reported a link between glyphosate and a type of cancer called non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. An employee of Monsanto wrote, I will begin working on this in case things don't change and the paper gets media attention. And he says of the Canadian study, the quality of the data is not great. Maybe not great for Monsanto, but John McLaughlin, one of the study's main authors, is today among the most respected experts in the country. He is chief scientist for Public Health Ontario. We were surprised scientifically because there was no prior evidence at all from any place that glyphosate was a, a risk factor for any of these cancers. But once it popped up in our study, we just had to report it. When the Canadian study was published, Monsanto is pleased that the word glyphosate does not appear in the article abstract. A big step forward, writes Monsanto's chief toxicologist. It removes it from being picked up by abstract searches. Today, Monsanto still questions the validity of that Canadian study. The world dealt with it by other studies looking at the same question, and then um, in the next few years, a few other studies of similar design and approach actually uh, reported the same thing. In the following years, Monsanto worked closely with renowned scientists on glyphosate. But one word keeps appearing in the Monsanto papers, which raises doubts about some of these studies. That word is ghost writing. That's when someone writes an article, in part or in full, and rather than signing their own name, cites other independent experts who are considered more credible. And then at the same time as those studies are coming out, Monsanto is ghost writing studies that say the opposite. One of these studies will become the reference, according to Monsanto. It's published in 2000 and concluded that Roundup herbicide does not pose a health risk to humans. The study is signed by three scientists, Williams, Crows, and Monroe. That Monroe is Ian Monroe, the former Health Canada official, now president of Cantox. But this is how a Monsanto employee, years later, refers to this study. We would be keeping the cost down by us doing the writing, and they would just edit and sign their names, so to speak. Recall, this is how we handled Williams, Crows, and Monroe 2000. Well, let's be very clear about what Cantox is. Cantox is not some independent group of scientists offering scientific reviews. They might pretend to be that, but that's not what they are. They are institutions here to providing the scientific opinion that industries want. The lead author of the study, Gary Williams, says that this did not happen. Monsanto, which has since been bought by Bayer, also categorically denies these allegations. 
The authors disclosed that they benefited from Monsanto's scientific support. At trial, the judge was receptive to this argument. Under oath, one Monsanto employee explained that he made minor changes to the study for the sake of clarity. That's not what Bill Hyden said in his email. I mean, he said it clear as day, this is what we did, just like in the other one. We ghost wrote it. It's his words. But another Monsanto email to Cantox shows that Monsanto had the last word. I will review the final manuscript before it is sent to the publisher, wrote one Monsanto employee. Then in a private message to a colleague, Cantox thinks I would actually leave the final editing to them unsupervised. By 2002, Helen McInnes had been working at Niagara Falls Park for more than 15 years. Her health quickly deteriorated. She was diagnosed with a rare type of cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Helen was in shock. Oh, I can remember it, yes. I, it was like somebody took a sledgehammer and hit me. And I was so distraught that I had to phone Paul to come at my husband to come and get me at the hospital. I had to leave my car there. I couldn't even drive home. And I was sick, I was throw it up and everything because it just, it's a shock. It's something you go to the hospital thinking you've got the flu and find out it's cancer. Doctors don't know how Helen got this cancer. She soon began chemotherapy. So that was when they started me on what, um, I don't know the terminology name, but they did call it the Red Devil because it was a very, very harsh chemical that they had to put through you in order to kill off the cells. The disease forced her to stop working. When you have chemotherapy, you develop what they call um, a fog where your memory is not, is, so I was making numerous mistakes that I shouldn't have been. If I can't do the job, then it's time to leave. In 2010, the cancer came back. After treatment, Helen again went into remission. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away in California, for y'all that don't know, I am an integrated pest manager slash groundsman. I get you dirty every day. A professional gardener is about to become Monsanto's worst nightmare. Lee Johnson, here on a visit to Toronto, has made headlines around the world since he won a groundbreaking case against Monsanto. But the 47-year-old father, who is also a rapper in his spare time, is fighting a much bigger battle against cancer. The doctor told me I was running out of TikToks, life coming to an end and everything soon could stop. Doctors on the payroll, they chose a close eye. They really don't care if we live or die. So here, pop this, go ahead, pop that. Might as well live it up, because there ain't no cure for that. Lee Johnson is now being treated for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and the painful skin lesions associated with that disease. His cancer and what caused it is at the heart of his fight with the chemical giant. I really don't talk about Monsanto itself. Like even saying the word right there, I usually don't. I say the company or I say them or whatever because yeah, that's not my department to get into the science and whatever, but I do know that that's in the evidence, and the jury saw that about the science. His cancer first appeared while he worked as a landscaper at various schools in the San Francisco area. On some days, he would spray hundreds of liters of weed killer, and he was told that the product was safe. A trainer came down and, and, and sat at the table with us and told us that. Yeah, they were saving up the drink. Yeah, I don't know. That's what I was told, safe enough to drink. Lee Johnson wore protective gear, but despite being careful, his equipment broke down and he was drenched by the herbicide. Lesions then appeared on his skin. Cancer was confirmed in 2014. So the way I reacted to that was, am I gonna die? And they say, well, you shouldn't die from this, but yes, it can kill you. 
Um, so that was pretty hard to take. Yeah, that was pretty hard to take because there's not a lot of answers for this disease. Lee called Monsanto's customer service department. Yeah, so the first call was in November of 2014. He had just been diagnosed with cancer. He calls Monsanto and says, hey, uh, could this be related to the stuff? I, I don't have any other exposures. I'm just curious if it's related to Roundup. The person takes all his information down and says, we'll get back to you. They don't. Lee's request was never answered. In the fall of 2014, Monsanto has a much bigger problem. I'm Donna Farmer. I'm a Monsanto scientist, and I'm a mom. Monsanto official Donna Farmer sends an email to her colleagues. What we've long been concerned about has happened. Glyphosate is on for an IARC review. In March 2015, her fears were realized. The International Agency for Research on Cancer ruled that glyphosate is a probable carcinogen. This is done by reviewing the whole um, global literature of published research across many different domains. John McLaughlin, whose work was criticized by Monsanto 20 years ago, was part of that decision. He was one of those selected by the UN committee to study the risks associated with glyphosate. IARC hazard classification was based on evidence, the process, the practice, the, the uh, rigor with which that was done was rock solid. Monsanto totally disagrees. The decision, says the company, contradicts the position of most regulatory authorities around the world. It is biased and based on junk science, says Monsanto. Junk science was a term that was created by the tobacco industry to try to discredit the science that was suggesting that smoking and secondhand smoke was a cause of cancer. So I kind of almost chuckled. It's like, oh, there they go again. The committee's decision is criticized by journalists, academics, and on social media. Behind the scenes, Monsanto had a hand in organizing that response. The plan was to raise doubt about IARC's relevance. Monsanto employees proposed publishing articles that contradicted the IARC's results. They even suggested writing these studies themselves to reduce costs. Within months, 15 experts authored a series of scientific articles which claimed that glyphosate was not dangerous. They presented themselves as independent scientists, although 12 of the 15 had worked as consultants for Monsanto in the past. There was something that seemed particularly um, remarkable about the timing uh, and the, the strength of the immediate outcry that occurred at that time. Monsanto hired an Ontario-based consulting firm called Intertech to lead the project. Intertech was previously known as Cantox, the same company that was founded by former Health Canada official Ian Munro. Cantox actually evolved into the company called Intertech. And the first thing that Monsanto did, the first thing that it did, when it found out that IARC had classified it as a probable human carcinogen, is they paid a lot of money to Intertech to do a, quote, independent scientific review. And that has been published in five or six different articles, which were all carefully sculpted, carefully controlled, and, and in portions of it carefully written by Monsanto employees. It is hard to know what Intertech's exact role was. The firm was hired and paid by Monsanto. But was it a buffer or a go-between? Even the fact that it was orchestrated by industry suggests that it's not at all independent. The fact that they created a, these new publications or they organized the publication of things, well, that's actually not how scholarship works either. We write our own papers and we uh, do our own work. Here are a few email exchanges between Monsanto and Intertech, which show how the company closely followed the writing. January 6, 2016. Thanks for the updates on the animal bioessays and summary chapter. I had already written a draft introduction chapter, and then comes the question of who should be the ultimate author, you or Gary? 
Same day, another article. I think you and I should talk about how this chapter gets completed, as it's not exactly what I was expecting. January 13, here are my suggested edits. February 8, from Intertech. Please take a look at the latest from the epidemiology group. The next day, Monsanto says, okay, I've gone through the entire document and indicated what I think should stay and what can go. The authors all said in their declaration of interests that no Monsanto company employees reviewed any of the expert panel's manuscripts prior to submission to the journal. It is a flat lie. And actually, because of the work we've done, the journal that published them has actually come out and said, oh, we made some errors. The authors have since corrected their declarations. They now say that three of the articles were subject to minor revisions and that the company did not influence their conclusions. Two panelists, however, admitted to having been paid directly by the company for their contribution. All the authors apologized. Those papers weren't really scientific papers. A little bit more like an opinion, uh, an editorial, a relook from the perspective of those people. It's not surprising to eventually learn that, well, it was actually influenced by industry itself. I would put a very large ex flag of concern about the quality and integrity of those papers. A few days after glyphosate is deemed a probable carcinogen by IARC, Lee Johnson's equipment breaks again. For the second time, his skin is drenched. He is worried and again calls the company. Two weeks after the IARC decision, okay, he calls him again. His cancer is getting worse. It's starting to spread. And he's a little very worried. They tell him that they'll call him back, and they don't. And so he goes through an entire another spraying season. And during that time, his cancer goes from being indolent and controllable to being a death sentence. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. At trial, the jury ruled in Lee's favor. They concluded that Roundup can cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, that it was a substantial factor in Lee Johnson's case. They also ruled that Monsanto did not sufficiently inform the public of Roundup's dangers. Despite Monsanto's objections, the judge upheld the verdict. Monsanto is appealing the decision and says it does not reflect the current state of science. Whatever the future holds, Lee Johnson is ready. Everybody has to die. Everybody has to die sometimes. So, you know, they say a coward dies a thousand deaths. A soldier dies once. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, I don't, I'm not a coward. I'm not scared to die, you know, but if I have to die, at least I'll die for something. Neither Intertech nor Monsanto directly responded to our specific questions. J'ai commencé très jeune, puis je fais ce que j'aime, comme mon père le fait. Michel Gilina is a sixth-generation farmer who works 1,200 acres of land in Masquinongé, Quebec. And like the majority of farmers across the country, he uses glyphosate-based herbicide on his corn. C'est la façon simple de glyphosate. Hein? On applique ça, il, il a déjà été dispendu, il l'est plus. Puis euh, c'est la potion magique. On utilise ça pour toute plante. Là. But the magic of glyphosate has given way to concern. Farmers who are most exposed to the product are caught in the middle. I'm double sensitized because I have a father who adored who died of cancer, beaucoup trop jeune. Puis dans son entourage, je vous dis à cinq minutes d'automobile d'ici, je n'ai trois quatre les mêmes exemples, des producteurs du même âge qui. Alors donc, c'est quoi là? Canada was the first industrialized country to renew glyphosate after it was classified as a probable carcinogen by IARC. The government said that decision was based on science. Only a few scientists in Quebec study glyphosate. Elise Caron Baudouin is one of them. She looked at how different pesticides affect the human body. She tested glyphosate alone, as well as the Roundup formulation. 
dans la co-culture qui était exposée au Roundup, on avait vraiment une perturbation de l'activité de l'aromatase, puis une perturbation aussi de la production de, de plusieurs hormones, euh, des estrogènes entre autres. Her findings are preliminary, but other studies confirm her results. On sait aussi qu'une perturbation de la production d'estrogènes, c'est associé à euh, des problèmes de santé. On peut penser à des maladies qu'on appelle hormonodépendantes, comme le cancer du sein. Baudouin Caron found these results with Roundup only. The problem is that Canada does not approve Roundup or the hundred or so other commercial formulations. It only approves the main ingredient, glyphosate. Les résultats qui doivent être transmis ne concernent que l'ingrédient actif, mais dans la réalité, les ingrédients actifs ne sont jamais utilisés tout seuls. Ils sont toujours utilisés en formulation. Donc, dans la réglementation, les formulations ne sont pas prises en considération. Et on peut se poser la question si, en fait, la réglementation est basée en fait, sur toutes les données toxicologiques pertinentes. Health Canada recently renewed glyphosate's registration for another 15 years. Since the renewal, eight formal objections were filed by academics, physicians and environmental groups, including Equiter. Ce soir au téléjournal Monsanto, dans la mire de Santé Canada, des centaines d'études sur l'herbicide Roundup seront revues. C'est ces études-là que cite Santé Canada lorsqu'il parle de cet enjeu euh, du cancer en lien avec le glyphosate. Health Canada says the objections are not supported by science and that glyphosate does not pose a risk to humans or the environment at current exposure levels. Despite what the Monsanto papers say, glyphosate will stay on the market. To make its final evaluation, the government relied in part on 118 toxicological studies, of which 111 remain confidential and were provided by Monsanto. In fact, three quarters of the studies on human health were provided by industry. On the other hand, IARC relied only on published peer-reviewed research. The final decision came down to a relatively small number for which it was clear that they had good measurement, good design, good analysis. We need the Minister of Health Canada refused to have a panel of independent experts review the decision. The simple fact is, is the regulatory agencies that are designed to protect us have failed us. Brent Wisner, the U.S. lawyer fighting glyphosate, braved Ottawa's frigid temperatures to come up and meet Canadian MPs. In demand that our regulatory authorities work for us and not for them, until that happens, We're not going to see big change. This He came to tell them that Health Canada is on the wrong track. The data that's actually being reviewed has not been subject to independent peer review. And because of that, we don't really know the scientific judgment calls that went into making this decision. And I think that can be a real problem for public health. Sur quelque chose qui est probablement cancérigène. Enfin, il n'y a pas d'hésitation pour moi si c'est probablement cancérigène. Déjà là, il y a un souci. Glyphosate safety remains the subject of debate, and regulatory agencies around the world continue to reapprove it, despite IARC's decision. C'est quand même un comité qui est euh, qui est formé d'experts dans le domaine là. Euh... Il y a assez d'études qui nous permettent de dire, ben, peut-être on devrait se pencher un peu plus là-dessus, peut-être qu'on pourrait utiliser le principe de précaution dans ce cas-là. In Canada, the industry has not sat idly by. This email from Monsanto shows how the agricultural lobby considered asking the Canadian government to stop funding IARC. That is disturbing and it has nothing to do with really advancing the science, nothing to do with improving health, protecting health, or even, even uh, helping to make food for the planet, which is really what the company could be focusing on. We don't know if this demand was ever delivered, but none of this reassures Michel Gélina. There are a lot of products, even after several years, that come out, and that 
Euh, ah, on n'a pas pensé à ça, on n'a pas vu ça de même. Puis là, ben, tel produit, là, il est enlevé sur le marché parce que là, il, il a tel risque ou tel risque. He relies on Health Canada. Tout ce qu'on veut, c'est de fournir des aliments de qualité, puis bien faire des choses, puis en même temps se protéger comme producteur aussi. Health Canada granted an interview to our colleagues at La Semaine Verte and L'Épicerie, but refused to talk to us. In its final review, Health Canada found disconcerting the assertions of improper or misleading citations in studies done by Intertech or Cantox. And although those studies were used to reapprove glyphosate, they said that the articles did not impact the final decision. In the U.S. this year, seven additional lawsuits are planned against Monsanto. Thousands of others are pending. The Johnson case is not over. The appeal filed by Bayer will soon be heard. But regardless of the outcome, Lee Johnson is satisfied. I was told by my legal team, we'll go through years of appeals. These appeals might outlast you. You might be gone, but at least you don't you're supposed to do for your family. So that's what makes you feel good. Twenty eighteen was a bad year for Helen McInnes. Her cancer came back for a third time. It just controls you. It preys on your mind. And when it keeps coming back, you say, you know, why me? But there's a reason, and we don't know. Helen is here to meet her oncologist to get her latest test results. She's anxious to know what's next. How are you? Good. Other than, like, I had the reduction done on Wednesday. Yes. Last Wednesday. Mm -hmm. The question is really how much benefit you're going to be getting from that right. drug. Helen will never know for sure what caused her cancer. She now thinks it might be related to her multiple exposures to Roundup. So that's when I went through workman's compensation, but was denied because they said there wasn't enough information. They didn't feel that it had any bearing on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Workman's compensation in Ontario made that decision before IARC judged glyphosate a probable carcinogen. One of the studies used to reject Helen's claim concluded that glyphosate was neither cancerous or genotoxic. That study was authored by Williams, Crows, and Ian Munro of Cantox. There are contradictory versions as to how that Cantox paper came together. But this memo from Monsanto, dating back to 2000, is revealing. A senior executive thanks several employees for collecting data, but also for their writing and editing. Cantox is also thanked, along with a public relations firm, for their infinite edits and reviews. She invites employees to use the article to build Roundup sales. <laughs> Helen is responding well to her treatment. It's good news. Definitely. <laughs> I say mission, yes, but I just keep fighting and it's, I'm going to beat it before it beats me. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm going to be around to talk to you again about this, trust me. <laughs> Cantox no longer exists. Its former president and founder, Ian Munro, died of cancer in 2011. Before he died, he left a million and a half dollars to his alma mater, McGill University in Montreal. The chair in food safety now bears his name.